Hi, I'm Damien Rowland. And I'm Rachel Rowlands. And we're here together to talk about our new paediatric sepsis screening and action tool. There's been a lot of debate and uh, lots of growing evidence on the treatment of sepsis in children, but no one's really managed to implement a system that has definitively picked up all those children who present to emergency care who definitely have sepsis while screening out all the children who are just kind of virally and a bit hot and bothered. So we've implemented a tool in our department which we hope will improve the care and quality uh, of treatments that our patients receive. The challenge is that patients present who have a general appearance or phys physiological parameters which are deranged and those children may be thought to have sepsis or not thought to have sepsis, the recognition phase. The problem is, is that we don't always get this completely right. So even those children who are thought to have sepsis we don't respond adequately to and those who aren't thought to have sepsis, we need some way of recognising that they do have sepsis and responding appropriately. Essentially, you need to think sepsis to beat sepsis. And in paediatric care, it's really important that we understand the case mix that we're receiving. Children, especially those who are less than five years, often become tachycardic and very miserable with a fever and only a very small percentage of these actually have sepsis. It's quite different from the, the adult uh, conundrum. So what we've decided to do is implement a two out of three system. You have a temperature, of course, but you need to remember that some children who are very hypothermic, especially those that are less than three months old, could have sepsis as well. In our department, we use the POP system, which I'll go on and talk about, but you may also use PEWS or other scoring systems. Finally, the capillary refill time is a useful uh, but not independent measure of the risk of being uh, kind of a little shut down. So that's the, the recognition phase. In our department, we've decided that having a POPs of four and above is a good screening measure and we're going to be doing ongoing audits and research into how effective this has been. But for the moment, if you present with a fever and you have a POPs of four and above, then you need to consider, could this child have sepsis? Be aware, though, that children less than three months of age, those who have had recent surgery or immunocompromised, um, are at increased risk. Uh, importantly, although that there's some really obvious uh, examples of sepsis, the, the non-blanching rash of meningococcal septicemia, for example, there are other things which are more subtle. For example, if you've had a recent burn and present with a wound infection, that could be uh, a sign of early sepsis. And those children who present with uh, mobility problems, could they have sepsis arthritis? So think, could this child have sepsis? And always ask for a clinical review if you're not sure. If it's yes to this question, then you need to start considering the more serious signs of sepsis, i.e. red flag sepsis. So the way that we've worked this in our um, department is that we ask everybody to have a look down this list and see if any of the following red flags are present. So we're, we're looking to see children that aren't responding appropriately, children who are grunting or babies, especially newborns who present with apneas. If you have got near patient blood tests and they show a lactate greater than four, we've decided that that is a marker of children who are more high risk. And we've also looked at the POPs or the PUSE score. Obviously, kids who've got a non-blanching rash, most of us should recognise that as a severe sign of sepsis and we would need to treat for meningococcal septicemia. As Damien said previously, some children are more at risk and again, less than one month old and with any reported temperature of more than 38, Treat this as a serious infection until you know better. Children who've had recent chemotherapy or are known to be neutropenic, and babies who just aren't weighing as often as they should do, so whether they've had a wet nappy in the previous 12 hours. If any of these red flags are present, then we ask our, our staff to go on and, and treat them as if they've got what we've determined as red flag sepsis. This comes on the back of a lot of the work done by the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, which has defined red flag sepsis as those patients who um, we know treatment within an hour will help them. So as we say, this is time critical once you've identified red flag sepsis. And we ask that a senior clinicians involved from this point on if they don't already know about the patient. We start our paediatric sepsis six and we try to get all the actions completed as soon as possible, but always within the 60 minutes from identification. 
So on the back of our pro forma, we've got a useful checklist, which basically um, gives people the space to write down the time and sign for all the interventions that have done. So the paediatric sepsis 6 talks about giving high flow oxygen to children who need it, making sure that you have IV or IO access and taking some blood tests. And we prioritize getting a culture and also a gas so that we can look at the lactate. You do need to think about further investigations, such as doing lumbar puncture tests in, in small babies who might have meningitis, but none of those should delay treatment. You need to get on and give your IV or IO antibiotics as per your local guidelines and to consider fluid resuscitation. The fluids that we give are in line with the nice fluid resuscitation guidelines that have come out recently for children. So 20 mils per kilo of normal saline or consider 10 mils per kilo in babies less than a month old. You do need to be careful about fluid overload and you should be checking for this throughout your resuscitation. Again, we've got a prompt to make sure that people have involved a senior. And if you do think you're going to need to give inotropes, you need to get hold of your local PICU so that they can be involved with the patient. Now, as we've mentioned on a previous video, um, we have sepsis boxes in the department, which give prompts as per the guideline on the front of them. Inside these boxes, we have all the antibiotics that are needed. Um, and instructions on how to make them up. And we found personally that this has sped up our time to giving antibiotics at the LRI. So if you think sepsis, act on sepsis. Now, occasionally you may see a child who doesn't trigger for red flag sepsis. They may not have any of the first three indicators of temperature, raised pops or pews, or a prolonged cap refill which means that they probably don't have sepsis right now, but this can be an evolving situation. So you need to make sure that you safety net those families if you're going to send them home. Equally, they may have markers for sepsis, but not any of the red flag indicators, in which case you still need to keep a very close eye and consider going through the entire paediatric sepsis six, but these children are less time critical. We also need to be really, really aware of mimics. Um, we talk about this a lot in adult practice, but also in children. All paediatricians know that a baby with bronchiolitis will come in, often with a low-grade temperature, breathing fast, and may well be grunting. But we know the picture, and we think it's bronchiolitis, so these children won't necessarily benefit from antibiotics and fluids. So it's important that a senior decision maker can overrule parts of this pro forma. Equally, we may see a child that doesn't trigger for anything, but our gut tells us that we're really concerned that they're septic. And if a senior pediatrician or A&E doctor has made that choice, the safest thing is to go on and treat them. And you can always stop treatment after 24 hours if things are improving. So thank you very much, Rachel. So that's it from us for now. Uh, please do have a look at the uh, pro forma if you work in our department. And if you're from outside the uh, East Midlands area, it would be great to have your feedback on what you're doing to recognise and respond to sepsis in your particular area. Uh, with great thanks to Survive Sepsis and the UK Sepsis Trust for getting the momentum around sepsis. And please do look out for the NICE sepsis guidelines, which are coming out in early 2016 and are currently out for draft. Thank you very much. Thanks.